Fancy experiencing sunny days, crystal clear waters, amazing food and incredible cricket? Then join Gulliver's Sports Travel in the Caribbean this June for the ICC Men's T20 World Cup. As a leading sports tour specialist for over 50 years, you can expect an amazing experience with options that include flights, tickets, hotel and so much more. So what are you waiting for? Find out more at gullivarstravel.co.uk today. Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Cricket Weekly podcast. Lots lined up in today's show. We've got our final reflections on the India-England series. We'll chat about where England go next. There's an epic test between Australia and New Zealand. There's a WPL, the PSL, a massive revamp in the women's domestic game back in England and an England tour to New Zealand that starts next week. I'm Yazran and with me today are Phil Walker, Ben Gardner and Katia Whitney. Um, we'll kick things off with a trivia question that we'll come back to at the end of the podcast. Um, lots of chat in the last week or so about England's worst ever winter. Is the 2023-24 winter the worst ever? So the question is, which winter did England lose the most matches across formats? The men's side across all formats. Um, something to bear in mind for the next hour or so. We'll come back to it later. Um, anyway, since we last recorded, Brendan McCullen has spoken to the media and it's probably the firmest he's been publicly about his team since he took over. He indicated that he expects change, which is hardly revolutionary for a coach after a 4-1 defeat, but this is newish for the current regime. Uh, he said, when you're exposed the way we have been in the back end of this series in particular, it does require some pretty deep thinking and some adjustment to make sure we're saying staying true to what we believe in. There are some things where you can get a little bit of luck on your side and you paper over a couple of the cracks. When you are exposed in the way that we've been here, you know that you have to get better in some areas. The next couple of months will be us working that out uh, and making sure that when we come to the summer, we are a more refined version of what we are at the minute. Um, Phil, what do you make of those comments? What does a more refined version of this England side look like come the summer there's quite a long break obviously between now and the next test match uh i remember danny rubin who is the press man for the england men's team saying to to some of the press people um last summer in fact it was summer before when mccullum was just coming through and and mccullum had made a point that it, when they lose he does the job he goes he fronts up when they lose a big game or when they lose a series he he will always put his hand up um, and I think it was it was long overdue uh, for McCullum to face face the media. And I think what he's done there uh, is, on the one hand, show some necessary self awareness, right? Because there's, that's not always been evident from some of his players who have maybe got a little bit carried away, or definitely got carried away with some of the bombast uh, and the you know the hubristic hype around the team. And part of that is understandable because you're a sports team trying to create your own cult and your own mythology and your own sort of sense of um, impermeable power and, and create that kind of mentality in the dressing room. I get where it comes from, but when it spools out in the media, as it has done from certain players in particular, you know, it's not harsh to, to mention like the madness of that Ben Duckett comment about basically saying Jaiswell owes, the, owes them that hundred because, you know, all the rest of it. There's various other examples. Um, and... And that has begun to uh, congeal a bit, right? And it's begun to to curdle and it's gone off. And I think McCullum is smart enough to realise that. And while it might be slightly ugly, but when you're winning, you can allow for that kind of, these sorts of declarations of your own uh, power and your own principles and these kind of slightly highfalutin ideas about what you're doing for the game itself, rather, as well as obviously your own your own chances, that's all very well in that you can kind of hold your nose a bit, uh, some of the more extreme comments. But after what's happened in the last few weeks, they needed, he needed to come out and uh, show a little humility, I think. And uh, and I think he, he's probably struck the pretty much the right tone there. Mm. Uh, th those those quotes I thought were um, were impressive, really. I, I didn't haven't seen him speak. I, I've read them. So I've been away for a few days. So I've uh, I read them rather than seen him. But I would imagine that he sat, he sat down and recognised that uh, you, 
they need to play the game, right? They need to play the media game. They need to play the social media game a little bit more as well. What does it actually mean in real terms? I don't think it means a massive amount regarding changes in strategy and tactics because I don't think there has, there has been significant fissures that have opened up in how they've gone about their cricket personally. Not what I've seen. I think there are moments when they could have been a bit smarter for sure. Um, there are certain sort of clutch moments where they could have been more ruthless, perhaps a sort of slightly sort of slower heartbeat in certain moments, not being quite so, so gung-ho in certain moments. But then someone wrote an interesting tw uh, tweet or maybe an email saying, bottom line, England wouldn't have won that Hagley test match. Mm. Uh, as in, they wouldn't have had the, the smarts to chase that target home. Well, they did have, have the whatever it is, whatever, the confidence, the self-belief, the smarts, the audacity to chase down 300 and plenty for a year and more. Um, they did it against Australia as well in an absolute clutch test match. They chased down a very, very tricky target on a, on a breaking up pitch at mm. Headingley. So I don't think there's, there's, personally, I don't think there's enormous fundamental structural and, uh, uh, and sort of, I don't think the thinking is dramatically wrong. Uh, I think they can always, as with every cr cricket team in history, you can be smarter at certain moments. Mm. And I think they will absolutely, in their quiet moments, really regret what's happened in the last few weeks because they had a chance. They had a chance in that second test match. But what do you think specifically they will, will they regret? Like what, I, what? I, think, I think they will regret that they, it's been, a, it's been a, a month and a half of missed opportunities. And when you go one up in a five test series to not win, to, to lose the next four, uh, and to get progressively more disillusioned with yourself, uh, and that final test match, mercifully, I wasn't, I wasn't able to watch it. Sure, uh, but um, that felt like a mm. like one of those kind of fag end at the end of a scarring tour where you you know your your heads heads on the on the plane mm. and all, all those other cliches. But I think they will look back at certain certain key moments through that series, and you can identify them. You know, dropping Rohit when they're 30 for three, could have been 40 for four. That second test match, India had a depleted team. They were play they were nervous because they never lose two in a row. Hell, hardly ever lose one. And England had them there. They had, they had certain moments in that series to do something extraordinary. And in the end, it's just been a reversion back to the mean. And that will be immensely frustrating for them. One thing that will really focus the minds, I think, is that they're not used to losing under Stokes, right? So the numbers still, after that first test match, Stokes' percentage of, of, winning percentage of England captains was far ahead of Brearley's, which is the next best of anyone who's done it for any length of time. Far ahead of him. Um, so he was statistically doing extraordinary things. And then to lose four in a row drags you back into the also-rans a little bit. In the, in the short term. Mm. And that will really, really frustrate them because one of the, the most peculiar things that have consistently come out from Ollie Robinson, our Ollie Robinson, as well as others, winning is, is great, but it's not, it's not the be all and end all. When you lose and you keep losing, you realise that winning is actually quite important. Mm. Um, I think there's something as well in terms of, like you can see these things and you can think like, who is he talking to and what does he mean? And is it is it about personnel? Is it about strategy? But I think actually a lot of it is just about asking players to be sort of honest with themselves and like, are they improving or not? And are they happy with where they are? And that's one of the things that have given these players confidence to, you know, uh, they give them a lot of trust to say, we believe that you are good players and you'll work out and find out the ways to do it for yourselves. And I think there's also an element of perhaps some of these players are almost content with where they are and, and perhaps like there's not enough sort of introspection in terms of what actually can I improve in the way that we've seen from Zach Crawley. I think when, when you're asking what does this look like, I think it looks like how Zach Crawley has improved. And you look at like we, we we've talked about this before, but but Ollie Pope and that freneticism at the start of the innings and the fact that at least as far as we know, he's he's happy with that. Mm. And I think this will be the kind of thing where you're having those conversations saying, actually, are you okay with being a player who, you know, only gets past 25 a fraction of the time and sure when you do it sometimes it's great but are you happy with being that or can you push yourself to be better and similarly with you know with Ben Duckett you had two, you one extraordinary innings and then several other starts in this series and again was was guilty of of throwing it away on a few occasions and also of perhaps you talked about that sweep stuff but that perhaps hit a fact that he wasn't as comfortable with his defense as you need to be you know playing high class spin in in tricky conditions 
fine, your defense might get found out. But still, I think there's there's trusting in your method and your approach. And there's using that thing that like, well, this is the way I play as a crutch to not improve. And I think it's looking to strike that balance as well. So yeah, in terms of strategy, I think that like there will be a few moments that they can, you know, go and say, we could have done this a bit better. And in terms of personnel, there's a couple things which I guess we'll come to, but I think it's more about actually challenging players to improve and not to be okay with their flaws, even though it's also part of, it's, it's a really tricky message to sound he's done it well, because part of what's happened until that point is to be okay with failure. And now it's like, well, don't be too okay with failure, mm. I think. What do you think realistic change looks like for England before they get going again in July? Um, well, it's tricky because if you if they hadn't lost the fourth test match so heavily, the fifth test match so heavily, sorry, um, then they could have there there might not have been the need for Brendan McCollum to come out and say that they might need to change a few things. They could have realistically come out and said, well, you know, we pushed India close in all of these five test matches. We won one. We could have, we, there are key moments where we could have changed our approach a little bit and taken advantage of them. But going out of the series with the optics being 4-1, coming off the back of such a heavy defeat, I think it lends itself more to there being some changes um, for the summer. What that looks like in practice, I think it's quite it's quite hard to tell at the minute because you can look at a couple of guys and say they've had really bad series. Like um, after the the 190 odd in the first test match, Pope has really, really struggled. Um, you can look at um, what who the spinner is going to be in the summer. Like, you know, is Jack Leach going to have recovered um, from his, his surgery? How do you then manage Hartley and how do you manage Bashir? Um, is Jimmy Anderson still going to be around? How do you get Harry Brook back into the side? Um and maybe that's going to be what the changes are going to focus on. How do they accommodate Harry Brook? Who is going to be the keeper? Is it going to be one of Bairstow or Folks? Is someone else going to come in? Um, is Bairstow going to play as a batter against having not had a good series? I think that's what it's going to focus around. Um, mm-hmm. If Harry Brook indeed can come back in the summer um, and demand that place in the side again. Mm. Um, there's a time-honoured sporting dictum that says uh, the best time to tinker with your personnel is when you're doing well and I think in the round England are still doing well I think they're I think they've found a few I think the, the same inconsistencies still apply but uh, certain players in the pressure cooker of India are going to come unstuck as has been proved throughout history and will continue to be proved until the end of time until cricket is no longer played in about three years uh, you know, you think about, say, Ferguson at United when he got rid of, of the three biggest players in uh, at the end of 95, you know, and brought through new blood and everyone said, you're mad. Well, and then it played out. It's a good time to to build when you you, you have a, a unified collective as they currently do. Um, and Ben's point is a good one, right? Perhaps it's not a massive jump psychologically from feeling like you are okay with being able to express yourself and failure is just a, just, just a word and mm-hmm. just a state of mind. Well, failure is a state of mind, but it's also a state of numbers and facts. Uh, and if we veer into complacency or any of these players veer into complacency because they feel like it's kind of almost harder to get out of the team than it is to get in it, um, then that's the time when any smart coach, manager, captain, leader gets, gets busy. Mm. Um, and I think McCullum, has, who's been around the traps playing all different formats of cricket, uh, has played tough, hard, gnarly test cricket and has played fun 20 over cricket. And he's made a lot of money doing this and made very little money doing that and given his all to all of it. And I think he's a smart bloke. I think um, he will recognize that with a year and a half to Australia and some tough test matches coming, especially away from home um, in the winter coming up, Six test matches against West Indies and Sri Lanka, which will be, you know, interesting games, but you would think that England would, would be relatively comfortable in those. That's the time. That is the time to be creative. That's the time to be absolutely honest with yourself and say, right, is Johnny Bairstow, who's 34 years old, is he your keeper bat for Australia in a year and a half? Or is Ben Folkes my keeper bat for Australia in a year and a half, which is only 10 test matches away or 12 test matches mm. maybe? Uh they're the big, big questions that they have to have. And, you know, what do you do with Jimmy Anderson? We know we know that Jimmy Anderson is a genius. We know that Jimmy Anderson is the messy of cricket. We know that Jimmy Anderson continues to confound and all of that. 
But do you want to go into another t- international summer with a 41 and a half year old leading your attack? Is is that the right way of doing things? It's not just him. It's it's Wokes, who was player of the it's series Wokes. last summer. What do you do he, with Robinson? He's who's plateaued? All of these questions. Woods, a similar age. Uh, you've got all these guys who've got central contracts who are much younger who've barely played. But actually, if people are fit, um, they don't get in the side. So it'd be really interesting to see what they do. Person, I completely hear what you're saying about the batters. I don't think the batting will change that much as a question mark over the keeping. I said it all in the dailies. I still expect England to ba- to start the summer with the same top seven that ended the last summer. Brooke Brook comes back in, but then you are basically picking your most in form and best five or six batters, right? Yeah. yeah. No one's really arguing that there's no one saying uh, Kent or Somerset that's saying, well, hold on. Here's my Ramprakash. Why isn't he playing or whoever? Yeah. There aren't players that are absolutely screamingly obvious to be picked. Dan Lawrence is probably the next in line. No one's saying that Dan Lawrence should come into that middle order ahead of any of the current incumbents. And then, and then with the Brook caveat, obviously that he comes back. And then even on the on the on the keeping front, um, a lot of these young guys went on a lion saw just now. Um, Ollie Robinson struggled. Um, he's not played. Uh, Div 1 cricket for what he's not thrived at Div 1 level for a while. So big question how he goes with Durham. James Rue batted four without the gloves, which sort of speaks to how much they rate him as a batter. But we've seen before young players come in and have a really good summer and take quite a few years to, to replicate that again. Um, and Jamie Smith doesn't keep for, for for Surrey and also had a had a quiet, you know, he's had a quiet-ish winter playing franchise cricket, sure. Um, but, you know... Th- th- to, to, to throw in a guy who doesn't keep wicket at all in rebel cricket is, is a big call and best to average 40 last summer. Um, mm. You know, so I, I don't actually expect much, much change, but I think it's really, really interesting to see what they do with the bowlers. Cause I think basically anyone, anyone could not play if that makes sense. It's all Cassia, uh, Cassia was gonna say. Uh, Yeah. You've also got like, if you look at the, the England lions that went out to India this year, they actually had a really strong bowling attack. I think mm. it was only Tom Laws in that bowling attack. who didn't have an England test cap under his belt. You have, Matt Potts and, and Matt Fisher and all these people. And they've actually got so many bowlers around the counties who they've, who've they got between like one and 10 caps for England. Um, but the question that going into the summer will be, is Wokes coming back? Are these people who've got all these caps coming mm. back? When actually you've got quite a depth of bowlers who have limited experience in, in test cricket, who you could turn to. Um, and I think it'll be a really interesting question whether they try and look to the future, to the Ashes series, and give these people more experiences over the summer when you've got the West Indies and you've got Sri Lanka coming to play, or whether they do go back to the people who are 32, 33, 34, 41, um, um, and have another summer with that. Um, Mm. Because we've seen this England side has been one for the future with batting, with giving Harry Brook, you know, the go-ahead and Zach Crawley and Ollie Pope and all that. But their bowling attack has been kind of the one that's been turning out, aside from Ollie Robinson um, and Matt Potts, summer before has been the one that's been turning out over the last kind of five years Mm. um and maybe that's the one that's more important to move forward into the future um like they've done with giving young spinners opportunities in in pakistan last year and now in india this year as well Mm. and also bang on by the way come come the come the sun with the seam bowling attack jimmy's not played an enormous amount of home test matches right in the last three years with any great success is that fair because he was out for a for the majority of the of the yeah. big series and Bro- broadly fair, yeah. yeah. I think it's almost fair to say he's become a better bowler away from, away home, from home, home. Right. Fell up falling away in second innings in particular, his average. Twenty one twenty twenty one and twenty twenty three, I think he's had relatively quiet summers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um and you're you're bang on, you know, the numbers prove it. You know, when he I think you said it astutely a few weeks ago, you know, when you see him away from home, that's when he really gets out all the tricks mm. and he almost sort of showboats in how brilliant <laughs> he is technically. Um, what what's more beneficial to English cricket over the next, not just six months, but six, 16, 18 months in, into that Ashes series? What's more beneficial? A new ball attack of Anderson and a another Wokes at Lords in June or July, or Tongue and Robinson, for example, mm. or Ollie Stone if he's actually fit for the first two months of the series, of t- first two months of, of or the someone series. like Potts who you, or Potts you know, who obviously had a really good, yeah. good winter after a quietish summer last year all of those options all of those options are kicking around matt fisher you mentioned him but all of these names or atkinson who didn't get a game or in atkinson the, in the who, tour. just yeah exactly just want a bib for two months <coughs> so all of these players are intriguing all of them have been looked at and continue to be looked at and yet we don't have a clue perhaps tongue with the exception of robinson obviously who's had a couple of years as a cricketer but tongue perhaps looks like he 
he, he is the real deal, but who can say? And you need a battery of them anyway. So, so look, it sounds almost counterintuitive after Anderson rightly has received all the plaudits and the adulation mm. for what, what he's done, which is a record that will never be broken by anyone ever again, certainly doing what he does. Mm. Nonetheless, do you want to see him taking the new ball at Laws in the first test match? Literal question. Do you want to see him taking the new ball at Laws, even if he's picked up a five for in his sleep for Lanks the week before? Um, Perhaps you do. I don't know. Perhaps I, I I'm, do. I'm not, I'm not against it. I, for me, I think what's important for England is they need to identify who they think the core in the, after this year will be. And whoever they think that is, I think they need to have a good go. They need so to have of, a good go. So of, of those seamers you mentioned, of, you, of those seamers you mentioned, and you know, you had Sam Cook to that list, and he's not played a test match yet. Um, of those seamers you mentioned, it probably is only one or two of them that that will, will, will feature prominently in, in two years' time. And I think they need to identify who those guys are going to be and not many of those guys are going to get a go. And I think those guys can play with Anderson still around. I think Anderson, surely if you've got a guy who's 25, 26 and because of injuries hasn't played much first-class cricket, they're going to learn so much from from being in the same team I, I would, as Anderson. I would add. And Anderson is going to be very important, sorry, next next winter as well. England go to Pakistan. Pakistan is going to be a harder tour than right. it was last time right. because there's no way Pakistan's attack is going to be that poor um, as, as it was in, in 2022. So I think Anderson will be important for that tour if he still fancies it. I, I would also say... Obviously, he's around the team. Mm. You know, he's around the squad uh, as an official part of the squad or as an unofficial member of the entourage. Obviously, he'll still be around. But I think it's now time to move away from hanging it on on, on his genius. Um, and I think it's now time to find out if Robinson, for example, can fill those shoes properly, substantially. It's time to have a proper conversation with Wokes about what he wants to do with his with mm. his, what's left of his career. Is he is he open to two winters away? Um, he, he, of course, he'll fancy a home test match. Of course, he will. Uh, but is that the way that you want to go about these things? You know, mm. it feels like this is the end of the of part one. Yeah. Right. And now now's the time after this reality check of the last last couple of months and up to a point what happened last summer. Now's the time. Uh, to open up, I think, a little bit, mm. to start really looking forward longer term than where we're at at the moment. Mm. Uh, David writes in to say, it is plausible that Bairstow <laughs> might have played his last test match. And I've been thinking about how he'll be remembered if this is the end. In terms of talent, he probably ought to be leaving test cricket with a similar reputation to Matt Pryor, uh, a competent keeper, but the heartbeat of the team in the field and someone who changed games with a bat from number seven on a regular basis. But unlike Pryor, he never had the benefit of an established top six ahead of him. Instead, because of the lack of middle order options in his era, he's been all over the order, uh, with and without the gloves, never one thing or the other. And sadly for him, will probably be remembered as being fortunate to have played as many games as he has based on stats. That got me thinking about other players who've been unlucky with the era they played in and how they're remembered as a result. Alex Stewart, for example, who if he played with either Botham or Flintoff at their peaks, might be seen as the best England opener of the modern era, regularly dominating high-class pace bowling. But because he played in the 90s and had to keep and be the all-rounder at number six, he's remembered primarily primarily for his longevity and for getting out to Shane Warne a lot. Chris Wokes has had a decent test career, but if he'd been around in the 90s, he'd have been one of the first names on the team sheet, occupying that troublesome bowling all-rounder slot, underwhelmingly filled by the likes of Reeve, Lewis, Elam, Hollyoke and the infamous Gavin Hamilton. A 90s Wokes would have allowed Stewie to open, Jack Russell to play 100 tests and crucially could have prevented Ronnie Arani's test career. It's a bit harsh. Uh, who are some other players who could have been better off playing in another era? Conversely, who are the cricketers who got lucky with the team they played in and aren't as good as people think they were? Um, that's a great question. Um, Brilliant question. Any, any names? Any names stand out? Well, I guess one sort of category of player is the one who whose opportunities were just limited by mm. players who were really good above them. You know, you could, the, the Australia second level might have been the best, the second best test team <laughs> in the world in the sort of turn of the century. Mm. Uh, you think about, you know, Stuart McGill, for example, uh, you know, Simon Cash, still played a bit, but... Would yeah, like amazing record opening the batting, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and ba sort of overlapped with loads of those greats. So the period in which he did really well opening the batting was, was post Langer Hayden, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Phil Jakes, maybe. Uh, you could say the same probably about lots of those West Indies 
quicks back in the day. Mm. So that that's one sort of category. It's harder to find those guys, and he's right about Bairstow, but in that sort of category of players asked to do uh, a lot of things. I guess, I don't know if, if Moen Ali, he, like the England never found his role, but partly that was because as well, he was being asked to fill so many different things. And I always felt that, you know, just as a pure attacking spinner, uh, he was lethal. And if they could have found a way for him to, to be doing that basically all the time, maybe that mm. could have could have been something. I don't know. What, what did anyone else have? You got anyone? Mm, in a similar kind of way to Moeen Ali, if they'd managed to find a way for him to be more of a regular part of the side, someone like Adil Rashid mm. could have had a, mu- a very good test career um, if they'd managed to organise it a little bit better maybe or played in an era like now where they manage spinners um, a bit better than they did back like 10 years ago. Yeah, maybe. 100%. I mean, th- well, that Rashid so, so, sorry, on, five on test that, matches. Just to, so, so I had Monty down. Monty Panesar for the same kind of reason, mm. really, that spinners were misunderstood, perhaps, and his mm. particular virtues were slightly distrusted. And then Swan came and and barged him out the door. Uh, but I think Monty, in a slightly more attacking vein, uh, trusting his mm. his quirkiness, uh, I think they could have got more out of him, definitely. Mm. Um, back- I don't know, with the team they played in, get, getting lucky with the team they played in. I don't know about that so much. But there are some players I remember differently because of the the era they played in and not adjusting averages. So particularly, I think some certain batters in the in the two thousands, like you know, Tilan Samaria, for example, comes out of that you know with a, an average of, of of close to fifty. But there'd be a lot. I'm not saying he wasn't a good player, but lots of you know big scores in 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 high scoring draws, for example. Like mm. he, uh, that you could you could list off other players from that era as well. But I feel that's more of an era thing rather than the team thing. Uh, but then maybe, I, I mean, I know he's one of your favourites, Phil, but do you feel like Mark Waugh in a tougher era right, without I had, such a, a strong team? I had Southern. him down as well, actually, in that he was lucky. I mean, you can kind of say every Australian who played during that great team was kind of lucky, but mm-hmm. then you make your own luck because you're a part of a culture and you help create the culture. But I did, ha- I did think of Mark Waugh in this list because... In the most uncompromising cricket team in history, he was almost allowed to be himself, allowed to give it away, allowed to be slightly more flighty than other players at number four because he wore his collar up and he and he was cut from the most perfect satin cloth you've ever seen. But then also, you know, he he was the greatest second slip of all time as well. And and he worked in the overall setup of that side. He also made tougher runs than than uh, than he was maybe given credit for. Mm. Um, but still, an average of 41 in that team, batting four, the plum spot. Yeah, you could possibly, if you're being particularly soulless, Ben, you could probably say that he, he, <laughs> he may be slightly lucky. Um, unlucky is Kemar Roach, right? Yeah, Kemar Roach, if he'd been born 15 years earlier, would have been a third or fourth seamer alongside all those greats and would have had a lovely, lovely, lovely life. Instead, he's been... Lugging this 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 pain up a up a very steep hill for the last ten years, he's an incredible cricketer. Kemar Roach doesn't get anywhere near the the recognition he deserves because it's it's been happening with this kind of melancholy air around mm. it, you know. But the numbers are great, and and he's stuck at it. He's always available as well. He never never legs it, never walks away. Mm. Um, Mike Gatting, go on. thirty test ma- thirty test matches in was averaging twenty three, but mm. he was popular, clubbable. Uh, he was Beefy's mate and Lammy's mate and mm. and Gower's mate. So thirty test matches, averaging twenty three. Have another go. And to be fair, after that, he played. He played well. But so get, interesting. Your opinions on Mike Gatting and Zach Crawley could not be more different. <laughs> but, <laughs> each have averaged at the same point. Yeah, well, Gatting's average is comfortably better than Crawley's probably <laughs> uh, at this point. Um, someone's asked about crumbs of comfort from the the English no, perspective. I, 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 Are you I, doing I, that? I, I've got one more. Okay. Uh, Probably it's going to be quite controversial. And I'm not. I'm not. I'm saying he would have still had a very, very good Test career and would have played over 100 caps. But I think Stuart Broad is is fortunate to have played 167 caps, given the, the era that he played in helped England for actually for the first half of his Test career. Uh, even though he had a lot of success, didn't actually have a long list of seamers um, really pushing, uh, really banging down the door. And Broad. Uh, I think played a lot of test matches in the first half of his career in particular. And even actually in the second half, when he had the likes of Wood and Archer come in, where actually uh, he did well to play as much as he did. 
Mm. Um, and, you know, he's still definitely a 100 test match player, but 167 tests, I think he's, you know, if you compare it to Anderson, Anderson was undisputedly in that England team for the last 15 years of his career, um, sort of no matter what they had. I think Broad was probably fortunate to survive for as long as he did. Um, and yeah, and, and if you look at the last few years of his career, that he played so much was, was partly to do with injuries as well. Um, he didn't have an exceptional record overseas, misses the Pakistan tour towards the end. Um, so yeah, and still, I, still a great, obviously. But I guess you'd say as well, if we're talking about batting average being inflated in the noughties, you could possibly say that like it, you, you might come out of, you know, a few English summers having taken lots of wickets at 28, say, and people mm. say, oh, you know, he's, he's, he's done really well. You might actually think, is that only sort of par for the course actually when mm. uh, when you know bowling can uh, batting can sometimes be as tough as it is mm. here, I suppose. No, 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 definitely. Um, moving on, uh, Matt says, listening to the pod on Saturday, I found myself amused by the question, will India ever lose again at home? I've thought this question. The answer is not about India. It's about oppositions having the right plans. 12 months ago, Australia prepared with a three-day spin camp on a suburban twos, threes ground. As a result, they were caught cold. And by the time they woke up into the series, India were able to produce a road in the final test to swim to safety. Uh, it was an opportunity lost when India were there for the taking. Here, England have picked two unknowns with barely a dozen first-class games between them. In the case of Bashir, he was picked off Twitter. Knowing four spinners would be needed for five tests in India, there is no evidence of actual planning throughout 2023. English spinners couldn't get a game in the championship, and as a result, they took three novices and an injury-prone leech. Presented with the option of bringing in a warmed-up Dawson, they stuck with the same two who were out on their feet. My final point is, where are the local batting consultants? Some of the so shot selection in this series was abysmal. I wonder whether any thought was given to using someone like a Sangakara or a Jaya Wardner. Worth noting that Australia, for what it's worth, used backroom staff with local expertise. So I think the answer lies very much with a touring team's desire to treat any India away series with the care it deserves and not simply a reciprocal TV rights box ticking exercise. Um, I, th I think that's I think that's very interesting. Um, I, f I feel like Australia they they started that tour with an, with a plan uh, of how to score runs those pitches and it and it just backfired so badly and they actually adjusted quite well. But um, I suppose there have been moments in each of the last two years where India have looked like they they could lose at home. But I think our discussion the other day was sort of like with Jadeja and Ashwin in the side at home, it just looks so hard. To, to beat them over four or five days. It's, it is hard. Yeah. <laughs> we can establish that. <laughs> There's a piece written by um, Abhishek yesterday on, on Wisdom India there. It's that I didn't know that India have lost like three home test series in the last 37 years, yeah. um, which is Tough. ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I mean, England clearly, I mean, they, they prepared okay because they, you know, they won, won, that, they won that first test and caught, caught India God. I mean, sure, you, you can talk about the structure of the English game, and and we do often, but like that's sort of part part of like you know that's not down to you know Brendan McCullum and Ben Stokes. It's not it's not really their fault that spinners aren't bowling in English cricket. And I don't think you know I don't think picking Liam Dawson was the difference between, especially considering those spinners out bowled. So I I, I mean sure you might be able to question certain decisions made, but the point is is that like you have to be perfect in literally every way from like you know three years out, uh, and then also get lucky and even then they might still be too good mm. to, to beat you so i think that like it's it's, it's, with, it's with the bat right where they lost it you know I, isn't that just established that england spinners overperformed and yeah you're right you can put a big huge parenthesis around it these spinners have hardly played before so they've overperformed from a very very low base mm. but still they've overperformed um there have been moments where england seamers have struggled you know would in the last test match and so on but there's also been moments where they've been quite effective it seemed like they were always in the game in the field or generally mm. it's just with the bat you know joe played nicely twice stokes played nicely once Bairstow didn't get past 40 um pope played one knock where you very astutely wrote about it in the magazine the only way we can judge this pope knock and whether it ascends to some sort of masterpiece level is what follows what followed was nothing a reversion to mm. the mean mm. nothing uh duckett played nicely in patches and obviously played one mad innings uh but fell away crawley was the most consistent player in the side 
Um, they lost it with the bat. Mm. Absolutely lost it with the bat. And folks is manful at seven, but limited. So that's where that's where they, this series was was lost. And they did have their moments. And the frustration is that, <coughs> excuse me, none of them were clearly out of their depth because each of them had a day out. The only one who didn't was Bairstow, but then Bairstow was constantly getting in and he, then yeah. shot selection was getting him out. Uh, immensely frustrating to watch him this 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 summer. Yeah, he, he actually looked he actually looked really good. A lot, often <laughs> often he did. He looked in control. At all. And then he plays something yeah. unnecessary. Uh so that's where they lost this this mm. series, sure. But we spoke about we spoke about preparation before the start of the series, right, right. We spoke about them being in Dubai rather than in India. And from what I remember we concluded that they had actually gone into this series with quite a clear thought process of what they were going out to do with the bat. They just didn't execute it. They played on on the flat plate pitches in Dubai and they had a quite clear plan of how they were going to prepare and how they were going to execute it. So I don't think, going back to the original question of mm. how sides prepare for, for India, I don't actually think that they got... You can question whether they should have been in India preparing and playing warm-up games and you can question everything that goes into that from the schedule, from being in India that long to everything. But I don't think the preparation was too far off what it should have been. I agree. It was just the point of going there and mis-executing it, perhaps being slightly overconfident and not adapting to what was going on as it was happening. Yeah, I think that's the key point, adapting, because the, that, that prep they did in Abu Dhabi was they basically thought the pictures were going to be like what they were last time. They prepared for that and they won the test match when the pitches was sort of like what they prepared for. And then they had four pitches that were different to what they prepared for. And there wasn't much evidence of adapt adapting at all, actually, in the, in the, in the last four test matches. And, you know, you look at how Pope and Duckett got out in the, in the end of the series. You're like, well, you, you've seen that this is, this is a 450, 500 pitch. These are not shots you play if you think 400, 500 is par. Um, so... I yep. guess that is, you know, you, you look at England this winter broadly, they have misread conditions and, and mm -hmm. a, a, a few times in India. Um, you know, th that first test was a long time ago. You know, they, they, they had a succession of flat pitches and it felt like their preparation was, was for different surfaces and they yeah. didn't really adapt for that yeah, um, over absolutely. the course of the series. Um, David says, um, it's dark and the end of a long winter we need something positive tell us something about england's performance in india that gives us reason to be cheerful ben why should we be cheerful well i, I guess the, the the most obvious thing is we said it's just, just those spinners that they found you know you know times england english has been looking around for like one spinner and that was the kind of choosing between four somehow and mm. there actually is you can make a case for any of those four to you know to start the summer and actually i, I wonder if they'll be clever with it and look at you know in different uh conditions different situations different team constructions that you know maybe if if wokes plays you don't need hartley or maybe if stokes can bowl that means you can bring the leggy and that sort of thing uh so that 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 is huge obviously there is the again the the asterisk and the question mark over whether over how those guys develop and what chances they get going ahead but uh but you know there are four hugely talented players there and that that's really exciting and obviously the other is just is just Crawley like somehow you know from from being a guy who we thought might make you know we were questioning whether you could have an opener who on his day would be brilliant uh but did he need specific conditions for those to be his day for it for it to be his day and uh and could he contribute outside of that to now being like like the most consistent of England's batters and he's actually you know he's not even in what you'd call prime years yet he's maybe just coming into that mm. and then you know that is really exciting for you know a series uh, for the cut for the series coming up in conditions and against teams against who he has had success before it's not impossible we're in for like a pretty bumper two years from him and mm. that that's encouraging as well i guess mm. uh i'm really interested by show bashir mm. he, he's the one that i my, my eye goes to more than the other two young ones um, there's a feeling, that obviously, Jack Leach, we don't know the state of his injury and he's been really, really unlucky. Uh, he still probably has the, the spot if if everything's well, but it often isn't with him. So if we can imagine that it's between those three initially, perhaps, uh, Bashir seems to me to have the most repeatable action and, and, and spins it uh, enough. Obviously, the huge question is what you can do in English conditions. There, mm. there is the perception, perhaps, that Tom Hartley is further down the line because he's a better bat. 
He's played a few games. Uh, he can offer a slightly more rounded package. But this Bashir, for me, who I'm slightly more interested in when I watch him, he just seems like he's the kind of bowler who could close his eyes and the action is so repeatable and he could land it pretty much where he wants to. Um, and when India were going after certain bowlers at certain points in the series, and then Bashir would come on and he just seemed to add that little bit more control. Uh, so he's the one that and I'm it, really interested in. And it's more than, more than control. He just he took the most first w- innings wickets of any bowler yeah. in the series and he only played three of the five test matches. And if we are looking um, at to Australia... And he gets, and he, and he gets, he, he gets players out when the pitch wasn't give, <laughs> giving that much. Um, Mike Atherton on the Sky Sports pod yesterday said that he, he thinks that Bashir could be the one that England England looked to. Yeah. And I, I, I've I, just copied him, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um I, I I'm I'm sure people uh will assume that you didn't listen to the Sky Sports <laughs> pod before coming on. Um I only got back but, last night. <laughs> um but yeah, I, I I I think it's I think Bashir is is I, I'm I said it last week, but I'll say it again. The more he bowled, the less credit Rob Key deserves for for sticking him in because I, I can so see why why they're interested in him. And it depends how much Stokes wants to take on that project as well because that was what Leach felt like at times. He was like, you know, a, mm. a, a project bowler. Stokes would be like, I'm going to make this guy the best he can be. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to really work on how we set the fields mm. and get him super confident all that sort of thing. And if he sees in Bashir, like the tools to to do something similar again, I think he will possibly relish that challenge as well if he yeah, thinks massively. like this guy can be world class and I can be the captain that gets him there. Mm. Massively. Also, I like, his, I like his style. I like mm. the way he talks. I like the way... He, he looks down the lens, you know, he's not cowed by it, considering he's come from nowhere. Yeah. He's never had any exposure or scrutiny whatsoever. And he's he's over there and and, and he carries himself really, really well. Root spoke very warmly about him as a as a character in the dressing room. Mm. For a twenty one year old kid to come from nowhere, that I think he's he's a really interesting cricketer. I love how he is around reviews as well. Right. Like, like w- w- when everyone else is interested of his own bowling, he's like, nah. And you, know, you could tell how much Stokes Already trusted Bashir's point of view. He's keen to take the reviews when he bats, though. Yes, that's true. That was very, very funny. Um, reviewing one where he got bold. Could, um, could, we, could we just do a minute or two more on Crawley? Go for it. Do you mind? Ha- have, have your space. Go for it. I'll put my mic down. No, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to, because you know my feelings. But I think he's made three 70s in this series. Is that right? Sounds right. Two in a game, and then he made one on, in the fifth mm. test, didn't he? Um, Got to be greedier, because he's good enough now. Uh especially against balls that aren't moving too much laterally. He's going to get a lot of that in the winter coming up. He's going to get a lot of that in Australia. Um, on the one hand, as an opener, he's, it's brilliant what he's doing because he's getting starts, he's getting giving impetus, and he's become madly relatively consistent. But if you get to 60, 70, and you are in that much control, just find a way. Find a way to go up and down the gears. That 189 he made at Old Trafford was... It's extraordinary to watch, but that's not the model because that was just, it was just what, a kind of a one track foot to the floor and extraordinary demonstration of, of consistent stroke play, mm. expansive stroke play. But that's not the model because there's going to be moments in the game where you lose one or two or a Bumrah like like player comes back and he's fit and the ball starts to reverse and perhaps after 40 overs, whatever it might be. You can't just keep playing like it's a Sunday afternoon and mm. you're and you're the best player in your under 15s team. He's he's so good this kid. Uh now's the time to prove it. You're saying next two years could be a bumper two years. It could be. Or also it could continue to be this this kind of adorning moments thing, mm. which is, don't get me wrong, net credit in this team massively, massively. But now's the time to not just be a really useful and attractive cricketer, but to be a world-class one because he has the ability to do that. 100%. I think off the last two series he had, and this is a compliment to him, I think he's got to a point now, if he has another one of those, people won't be talking about that in a positive terms. We've got to a point of root, root uh, at a similar age, actually, where he was too good not to be making hundreds. I think, I think Crawley's probably got to that point. Um, anyway, without further ado, we've reached a part of the podcast where we have to make the decision of who should be rewarded the Charles Tirrett moment of the test. Speaking of which, our friends of the podcast at Charles Tirrett are no strangers to helping men make difficult decisions when it comes to their wardrobe. 
let's be honest, sometimes we can all do with a bit of direction when it comes to what outfit do, we do, need just for that smart casual dress code. For our listeners, yeah, uh, we don't and need, watchers, we, we don't you are literally in your pajamas. That's not true. Stand that up. Is, that is not true. You're I'm not, I'm not going to stand up and I'm not in my pajamas. It's shocking. Anyway, Space so work. check out charlestirrett.com or visit one of their stores and they'll be able to help you look the part with their wide selection of shirts, trousers, blazers and knitwear. Don't forget to use the code SCORE to get our special wisdom discount of 20% off their full collection. Um, the moment of the test has to be, from an England point of view at least, Anderson getting to 700. Um, we mentioned the other day that this is a record that will almost certainly never be broken or, or um, anyone will actually come anywhere near it, um, the most wickets for a test seamer. Um, and I also suggested that his stock would be even higher if he started later and had fewer wickets if that makes sense, because his overall career numbers take into account quite a long period at the start where he was in and out the side, battling his action, not 100% fit. So a few stats for you on Anderson um, over the last 15 years, really. So from the start of the 2010-11 Ashes to now, Anderson has taken 512 wickets at 24, averaging under 31 in every country he's played in. That's extraordinary. Um, averaging 23 at home and averaging 25 away. If you compare him to someone like Cummins or Boomerah, who averaged 21, 22, uh, those guys only really started playing regularly in their mid-20s when they were sort of at their peak, obviously for different reasons, whereas Jimmy was in and out the side for a while. Um, over the last 10 years, which, remember, is from the age of 31 onwards, he's got six, 360 wickets at 22, which is only 23 oh. wickets off Botham's old record of Three, eight, three. So Jimmy Anderson, very good. Um, anyway, this has been a very parochial show, isn't it? A very English centric show. Yeah, I think we've sort of forgotten what we are a little bit because because, because <laughs> we because, know what we are because the the daily pods uh, obviously you got a lot of people from India um, really interested to to hear analysis on them. But our, our weekly shows are you know yeah true you know true. We, we we probably wouldn't. Uh, do uh, a, a five-minute section on the domestic restructuring in India, which we are, we are about to do. They don't need one, minutes. they're fine. Uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, anyway, moving on. Australia beat New Zealand in Christchurch by three wickets. Uh, it really did look like the Black Cats would get over the line in this one. Australia were 80 for five, chasing 279 before Mitch Marsh hit 80 and Alex Carey hit 98, not out to get Australia there. Uh, Pat Cummins, 32 not out. Not the first time he's been there at the end of a chase in the last year or so. Uh, ben, it's amazing that this New Zealand golden generation have never got a single test win over Australia when they've got multiple wins against everyone else. Yeah, well, I mean, Phil's put it this way before, but either Australia arrived in New Zealand or New Zealand arrived in Australia and those New Zealand cricketers just shrink by about a foot, basically. Mm. Uh, and 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 uh, But in having said that, I really did think that in this case, that might change. Basically, that this that this was the moment. But but no, you've got to go back what about thirty years for them to last have beaten Australia in New Zealand. Mm. There was one win in Hobart, I think, in David Warner's debut series. But 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 that's it. And it and it is yeah, it is kind of mad that there hasn't there hasn't just been like one you know one day out from Trent Bolt or Tim Southey that's you know won them a game somehow or one you know amazing innings from Cameron who's not he's not played well against them but that's that's actually gotten to win a game. And yeah, this, because cause this Australia side, uh, maybe as much as, you know, m more than in the last few times they played them, was there for the taking to an extent. You know, they came in and, you know, we talked about the West Indies win being, you know, a, a miracle for them, but that meant it was, you know, should have been a bit chastening for, for Australia. Um, and, you know, there are gaps in that side. You know, Steve Smith is, is struggling opening the batting and he's up there because there's a sort of a paucity of other candidates beneath mm. him there's you know guys at either ends of their careers and not as many in their primes one of those who is in their prime is Manus Labuschagne and he's also having a a tougher time of it um and then that 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 bowling attack Stark has not had a great couple of years and uh they're all also you know past 30 some of them you know closer to 35 than to than to 30 like it's that th th there were holes there possibly to be exploited and they kind of claim close to doing that. And in some ways, you know, this was a this was almost a miraculous comeback because they were they collapsed on that on the first day of the test. But in the end, it's just that same old story. Pat Cummins, by the way, I think it's three times Australia have chased two hundred in the past decade and a half. And Pat Cummins has hit the winning runs every single time with a boundary. Mm, uh, going all the way back to his debut test match. So 
just Australia's second overseas series win in eight years, by the way. Yes. Yeah, that's Pat, Pat Combs' draw level with Don Best for overseas series <laughs> wins. So. Can I just say on, on New Zealand and that series, it, it felt like quite an un-New Zealand-like aura almost mm. of the series. You had the whole, the Wagner stuff when they weren't going to pick Wagner, so he then retired. And then you had Ross Taylor um, almost taking a bit of a pot shot over the media um, and saying that he shouldn't have been forced to retire and then Kane Williamson. That, that was sort of mad, the Ross Taylor thing. We've yeah. not really covered it. So Ross Taylor obviously was only recently part of the New Zealand side. He s- suggested that Magna must have been forced to retire, which you know a few New Zealand players have since sort of dodged the question, but it do- definitely suggests that not all is well in the New Zealand camp. Yeah, exactly. Because then you also had Kane Williamson, who's obviously not captain anymore, but still still responding in a press conference saying, yeah, no, that that's not the case. No one's forced mm. to retire. But when you look at what Wagner said in his press conference, maybe not forced, but pushed, mm. maybe a little bit more strongly, maybe a little bit less strongly. Um, and then you had Southie also saying that Wagner might unretire. And then Southie saying after the loss in the second test match that he doesn't know whether he's going to be captain going forward. Mm. And that just seems very un-New Zealand-like to have that much chaos and not chaos, but that kind of uncertainty. It is chaos. It is it, chaos it, it, yeah. it's, it's unclear what that side looks like yeah. in the near future. I mean, the bowling attack that took them to um, the World Test Championship victory, Southie, as you say, has just said that he might not be captain for their upcoming tour of Asia. Trent Bolt's not around. Neil Wagner's just retired. And then Carl Jameson, that, that's the real difficult one because he's, what, late 20s. You'd expect him to be the leader of the attack. He, he's he's not going to play cricket again in 2024. He's been injured a lot. I think he's only played three test matches in the last two years. So that's a massive loss. So you, suddenly you're looking at what was, what was very recently a, a really formidable attack. You're actually struggling to work out who's going to be in it quite soon. Matt but Henry obviously very is doing very well. Matt Henry. Very, very good series for Matt and, Henry. And those two guys that came in, Will O'Rourke and Ben Sears, they, they, they looked really good. But again, with the Carl James thing, it's the question, can you keep these guys on the park? Mm. I guess, you know, Will O'Rourke bowled well in that first test match, misses the second. Mm. That, that would be the question as well, I guess. Mm. Um, ben, Phil Salt's got an IPL deal, um, which you're, you're absolutely gutted about. Well, yeah, I mean, I thought we might we might come to him earlier when we're talking about the the, the wicket keeping question because I think people don't realise quite that he has a pretty decent case if England are looking for another Test wicket keeper. Like there there are other guys in the conversation, but actually, if you're looking for a guy who is uh, has got Division One County Championship runs and you know England has been around the England setup, they clearly know like keeps in first class cricket regularly. Phil Salt is actually that guy and he also his style of play would fit right into what England wants to do. So, so yeah, I, I spoke to him and he was pretty forthright about how much he loves Red Bull cricket, just loves the rhythms of the county championship of of being out there in the middle in sunny Southport and just having time to sort of figure it out for himself and not, you know, have to, you know, wax an all nine for six or whatever. Uh, and, until he gets an IPL gig. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm willing to give him a pass this time with the T20 World Cup this <laughs> Can I shock you? I love Red Bull cricket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but so yeah, he averages what, uh, just over 40 in the past two summers. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's, a, that's a key point. So yeah. his o- overall career numbers are, are okay. They're not great. But in the last two years, where well, he's played a surprising amount for Lancashire, his record is very good. He's played the equivalent of a full season across those two years and made good hundreds against good opposition. So his first Once innings... Once opening the batting? Yeah, his first innings last summer, he opens the batting. Having come back from the IPL, makes 100 against uh, Abbas, Barker, Abbott and Dawson. So that, that's a proper... That's just about as high class as counting championship hundreds can get, really, in terms of attacks. Um, so, yeah, I think... And, and so I guess you think that, given that this summer for him is now going to be the IPL into the T20 World Cup, one, he won't have played any Red Bull cricket for close to a year by the time England come to collect some, uh, select some test squads and... Probably improves his chances. Uh, well, <laughs> possibly, yeah. So, I, I, you know, if he has a massive T20 World Cup and England are looking for the man at the moment, maybe there's th- there's an opening for him there. And if not, he'll have, you know, a full run in uh, in September uh, where he can push a case. For not necessarily possibly. because he's probably going to be involved with the England white ball stuff. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so, so he might not play very much at all Red Bull cricket for Lancashire this year. That's true. Yeah, but I also it was just an interesting, an interesting chat mm. with him. He was because I guess also when you look at these guys who their job is to come out and swing, you can kind of wonder if there's a lack, like how much thought is going into that, or if they are just you know, it's 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 the same shot each time. But actually, on the sort of the fundamentals and the philosophy of of T20 batting, it was really interesting talking about the uh, how. 
analysis and reaction can work together to get you into the right headspace where you're going out. So you can know exactly what a bowl is going to try to do to you. But you said it was basically, you know, 30% uh, in the moment, 70% sort of stuff prepared beforehand. And also talking about he wants to make big scores, which if you've seen him bat, you wouldn't have sort of intuited from that. But he says that how you balance wanting to sort of make big scores versus needing to what you need in the moment is by viewing each over as like a, a skill game in itself. So it's like, in that first over of the game, is your skill better than the opening bowler's skill? And if so, you you, you get off to a good, good start. And then the second over is is the same again, which is a, a really interesting way of, of, it's not like you're just going out there and throwing away runs, but it is like you're, you're challenging yourself to beat each person of the opposition when they come on to bowl you, which I thought was interesting to look at it, I guess. No, it's a very interesting conversation. I've, I've read Ben's right up of it. Um, before we next pod, uh, England's T20i series in New Zealand would have started. Uh, a reminder that Alice Capsey, Nat Siverbrunt, Sophie Eccleston and Danny Wyatt are only joining up for the final two games of that five-match series, sort of because they're in the WPL, but also not really. Um, Cathy, we were going over this before the pod. Um, New Zealand, I think, have, have managed this situation much better than England have in that their WPL players are just in the squad and they've included players as cover if those WL players um, can't, make the start of the series because when it was first uh, announced that the players in the WPL won't be involved in the whole series, you might have thought there's overlap, but there's not actually overlap. The the WPL final um, finishes two days before the start of that series. Uh, we're looking at it today. Sophie Eccleston and Danny Wyatt might be out of the competition today, uh, a full week before the start of the series, but it's possible they don't actually play any cricket for two weeks plus. And Danny Wyatt hasn't played a game in the WPL, but because she's been in the WPL and not played, she can't play for England for another two weeks. So it's it's a weird one. Um, what what should we be looking at from an England point of view into this series? Obviously, the T20 World Cup coming up. Well, we talked about the kind of the weird way in which England managed the kind of crossover between the WPL and the New Zealand series when the squads mm. were first announced. Um, but it was interesting watching UP Warriors last group stage game last night that John Lewis would be catching a flight hours after that game finished to go to New Zealand while um, Sophie Eccleston and, and Danny Wyatt were hanging around, possibly only till today. Um, it is worth saying, you mentioned like New Zealand have managed it better and I agree with you, I think they have, but it's obviously easier to have players on standby when you're mm. in New Zealand rather than having players on standby in England to fly out. Having said that, England Women A, Women's A are yeah. also in New Zealand. So, you know, that that could have been mm. an option for them to do. Um, I think there's quite a lot to, to look out for in the series. Like like you said, the, the T20 World Cup is, in terms of games, not that long away. Mm. So this summer, England have um, three match series and a five match series. Again, five matches against New Zealand um, T20Is um, scheduled before the World Cup. So after this series, there's possibly only eight T20Is before they go out to Bangladesh. Um, so there's a couple of things that it's kind of the last run in for people to can't come in and out of that side. That's normally pretty settled. The obvious one to look at is Sophia Dunkley, um, who's had a, a pretty, uh, difficult time, um, at the top of the order over the last couple of, or over the last kind of 12 months in, in T20s. And the one to look out for there is Maya Bouchier. She seems like the, the next one to come in, um, and she is in the squad, um, if Dunkley is to continue to have the, those difficulties. Um, there's also a couple of um, players who haven't uh, been capped yet. So Holly Armitage, Lindsay Smith, Holly Armitage in particular, particularly interested to see how she goes. She's been very good on the domestic circuit for a couple of years now, particularly had a really good Charlotte Edwards Cup um, last year for Northern Diamonds, um, who she captains. Um, and I think the fast bowlers as well um, are pretty interesting to look at because we've we've spoken a lot over the last six to eight months about how England have a really strong core of young fast bowlers. But when you look at the ones who are actually in the squad, there's not many of them. So mm. Mihika Gore is not in this squad. Um, John, She's doing her A-levels. Doing her A-levels, yeah. Um, and then Izzy Wong is no longer um, mm. around the England squad at the minute. She's in the WPL. Um, so Lauren Filer is the one that they, they've selected to to come in for, for New Zealand. And she, while everyone will remember her in the Ashes in the, in the test, test squad, she didn't play in the Ashes in the white ball stuff. She played against Sri Lanka, didn't have a particular impact against Sri Lanka. So she's one to watch to see how she goes um, in New Zealand as well and to see how that core of fast bowlers develops um, ahead of Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. uh, Grace Scrivens, she's with the, the, the Stiffs, right? The Lions or the, the Lionesses? 
Well, yeah, in your mum's day. Just called the A squad. There you go. So she won't feature? Probably not, unless right. there's an injury. Yeah, okay. So the shot that H. Cowan uh, sent me last night, which I've forwarded on to you, um, uh, we won't be seeing any of that just yet, but we are going to see lots of this in an England shirt, in a senior England shirt soon enough. Mm. Um, can we put that shot on some kind of Twitter type thing? Yeah, I think the world needs to see that shot. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Uh, it's spectacular. I agree. And it that, is worthy that, of the hype so, we're giving it. Sometimes a shot just is enough. Yeah. Right? And and this this is this is enough. My new favourite player and, and the great white hope of, of English female <laughs> cricket. The, 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 the Sherb Bashir moment. You see you've seen one shot, you're gonna put it on Twitter and then select it for every game. Obviously there's a lot more moments that she's already pulled off. Yeah. You know, she's probably the, the most complete young young English cricketer out there, but it's not just the shot, actually. It's that the, the player at the other end is starting to run down the pitch and she just goes, nah, don't bother. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah. Emma Lamb's kind of, you know, being dutiful. She said, no, nah, no, nah, that's gone. That's yeah. gone and then that's forgotten. A spectacular shot. Um, and, and the games in New Zealand, Katia, start at 1am. The, the T20 start at 1am. The yeah. one day start at midnight. Yeah. Bring it on. Yeah. Bring it on. You love it. Um, you might have seen over the last week uh, that quite a few counties have announced that they're putting forward bids to become uh, one of the homes of the eight professional women county sides from 2025. Uh, we've mentioned this on the pod before, but we've not really gone into it in a huge amount of detail. So from 2025, there'll be three tiers of county sides, um, eight elite centres. There'll be eventually be promotion and relegation down the line and tiers two initially, and tiers two and three initially will be semi-pro and amateur. So we're moving away from the current regional setup and Katty, you made the point that English women's cricket likes a restructuring uh, it's not the first time in recent times they've, they've gone for a restructure what are your initial reactions uh, to the news that they're doing this particular re restructuring moving back closer to, to a county model uh, my initial reaction was not another one <laughs> um, there's been I think this is the third time in eight years there's been a restructuring of the women's domestic stuff yeah. and, and I think it's worth looking at exactly how the women's domestic structure has changed over the last eight years and why it needs to change again um, and what issues this restructuring needs to fix that the last restructuring didn't fix. Um, so prior to, in 2016, you had the, the Women's Kia Super League come in and that was meant to kind of bridge the gap between the domestic women's cricket and the international cricket. Um, and alongside that was meant to happen, there was meant to be a new 50 over competition that was going to come in and replace the women's county championship, which is a one day 50 over competition, which back then, as it was, had about 30 sides competing mm. in it, including Scotland and Wales, at one point Ireland, the Netherlands, a lot of different sides. That 50 over league never came into place while the Kia Super League was in action. When the 100 was announced, they decided to scrap the Kia Super League um, and have and restructure the domestic circuit into eight regional sides that are based at first class grounds, but actually cover huge swathes of, of areas. Mm. So you've got the Vipers that cover like Sussex and and most of the South of England, to be honest. And you've got Yorkshire, so no Northern Diamonds, who also cover up to Durham and, and mm. all that kind of stuff. Um, and alongside that, you've got a pretty informal um, T20 league or lots of different informal T20 leagues where a lot of the region, the county regions will um, amongst themselves organize T20 competitions at different points in the summer. Um, and then above that with the with the eight regions, you've got the Rachel Hayhoe Flynn and you've got the, the Charlotte Edwards Cup, which have been in place since I think 2020, 2019, that kind of thing. Um, and that was to go alongside the hundred. So you've got the counties, the regional stuff and the hundred mm. as kind of like the domestic setup. Now we're we're kind of scrapping the eight regional sides. They are being given, so the ECB at the minute fund these eight regional sides. They're being given back to the counties. So counties are being, first class counties are being encouraged to submit bids for these tier one counties um, that they will then fund. But for the first, I think until 2028, the ECB will invest a million per year in these eight tier one sides that will be run by first class counties. Um, and as you said, they'll then be like tier two and tier three. And the eventual aim of that is to have promotion and relegation um, among those leagues to bridge the gap between the county stuff and the regional mm. stuff. That won't happen until at least 2029, 
that was put in the ECB's action plan for this. And it's important to note as well, a lot of this is being done in response to the ICEC report um, that noted the disparities in between opportunities for female domestic players and male domestic players. Mm. Um, it's like we were talking about just before we started recording that if you're a, a women's county player and you're 18 and you're not in line for one of these eight regions, there's very little places for you to go or if you can't make let's say you're you play for Sussex who have a really good county setup and you can't make the commitment to go and train at Southampton or mm. wherever you know that that's quite a difficult thing to overcome um so sort of however carefully you select the eight it's going to be very difficult for a lot of people yeah exactly and I think that's the idea between trying to kind of like level up these tier three tier two tier one thing but it's going to take a lot mm. of time um and we've seen with the hundred that kind of in increasing the profile of the domestic women's game in England is more than possible and actually financially lucrative and important to do. But what hasn't... That's, that's it. That's the key. That's why there's so much energy for this mm. from county CEOs, county chairs and so on. There's been resistance to bringing women's cricket into the fold of county club setups and structures no longer because they realise that not only is it the right thing to do, but it's also... The most profitable thing to do but the issue has been that when we've done these restructurings in the past it hasn't been done in a way that's made women's domestic cricket financially lucrative and attractive for people to come and watch mm. you know we were saying that you know you, you had in 2018 you had um or was it 27 when whenever it was last year whenever it was you had 15,000 people come to watch the women's international stuff at lords it was two years ago. Why am I thinking it's so long ago? And then the next day you had the Rachel Hayho Flint final mm. at Lords, and there were very, very few people in to watch it. And that goes into when there are these restructurings done, there's a big noise made about them when it happens. But then there's very little substance beyond that to make it the best product that it can be. Mm. When you give something the conditions to succeed, when you give women's sport, women's cricket, the conditions to succeed, it undoubtedly will succeed. But not enough long-term effort, planning, funding, marketing, everything has gone into these changes to make sure that that is successful in the long term and makes women's domestic cricket something that is successful. You watch, you go down to watch Charlotte Edwards Cup or, or, or the Rachel Hayo Flint Trophy, you'll have international players playing, you'll have overseas players playing, you'll have really, really good players playing. But either no one knows what's going on at that point or mm. they're playing in grounds that don't attract crowds to come and watch them. Uh, last year, the Rachel Hare Flint final was played on a, on a Sunday in September at Northampton. You know, no disrespect to Northampton, but the ground's actually quite difficult to get to. Even from Northampton Station? Exactly, because like Uber don't operate in Southampton, <laughs> so you've got to walk about half an hour to get, mm. to, to get to Northampton. I went to the Charlotte Edwards Cup finals day last year, which was in Worcester, and you had um, Southern Vipers playing with all the players that they've got and everyone. And you wouldn't have known it was going on unless you made an active effort to look for it and seek it out. And it's a marketing point as well, right? It's like totally. the, the, the 100 has shown how popular that level of women's cricket is. And as you say, the level actually in the regional competitions recently has been really high. It's not just you've got the best English players. It's still, even though crowds weren't great, we're attracting overseas players. So there's a demand for that level of cricket. And, you know, I've banged on about this point for, for ages, but, you know, I think that it, it, English cricket is, is, is righting the wrongs of, of, of the past, but in the past, they just didn't play cricket in big cities. It's <laughs> a very, very basic point, you know. Look at the, the regional structure last year. We're talking about the, the Blaze, um, who, who play most of their games at, at Loughborough. You know, that is not a cricketing hub. You know, that, you mm. know the historic link there was that uh, the university facilities, you, you, that's not where um, you should be basing one of your, your eight sides, really. Um, so it'd be, it'd be very interesting to see, A, which eight counties get yep. the nod, but B, when they get the nod, where are the games played? Because uh, I think I think it's really important they're played in big big cities. Totally, and, and not and, shunted and, out to exactly, out grounds. So exactly, exactly. Totally agree. Um, we understand, having spoken to a few people who've been involved in this, that I think the eight teams becomes ten in due course. Mm. That will hinge on whether the tier two teams have enough financial clout to to justify that expansion. But I think that's probably inevitable. Um, it sounds a bit dry when we talk about it, but it's not. It's really significant. Yeah. It's a really significant moment for the English game going forward. Um, and if you think about it, you think about the knock-on effect, aligned teams, shared goals, combined marketing, double headers, as you see in the 100 and how well they work, all would add up to the sense of a unified and progressive cricket club in line with 
with modern sports organisations, right? It's one of the many anachronisms that, you know, Essex County Cricket Club, North Essex County Cricket Club, they don't, they just have some sort of vague uh, distance, affiliate, uh, you know, allegiance or affiliation with, with a female club. By bringing it all in, uh, then then you can uh, you can start to really develop the game significantly. Mm. Um, the sticking point, of course, is that counties have finan- different financial uh, requirements. Uh, of course they do. Uh, but I think overall, we have to be really positive about this. Um, I think it's a really, really good move. I think it's it's a smart move by the ECB and and it's been received by the counties very enthusiastically mm. and that's that's part of it. I mean, there's so much factionalism in English cricket and in county cricket and self-interest, but all the CEOs have signed up to this. All the counties are up for it. Mm. Um, and there, there's going to be some grievances as well when you get turned down, right, for for being one of the tier one clubs. But then this is this is, this is sporting competition, right? You know, it's, it's, mm. it's necessary. One little thing might be interesting to see whether a, a club whose men's team is considered to be in the second tier of, of the sort of financial setup, but perhaps they could become a very, very clearly female oriented club as well, you know? So, so a, as I say, like a, a second division side could think, well, we're going to throw more of our resources actually at trying to become one of these tier one clubs. Um, <coughs> like the Doncaster bells of, of, of cricket, right? It could become, mm. so it could be really interesting to see how that all, all, all carves up, and there is no limit either to how much, uh, you, how much funding you you need in order to enter to tender. So, as mm. I say, there could be some really interesting decisions made by county clubs, and hopefully some some forward thinking decisions. I think it's a really really good move. This, mm. I think, there's a couple of logistical points that I've noticed about the women's domestic <coughs> game over the last couple of years that have been clear kind of missed goals I'm not I'm not great on football but you know that's kind of my analogy of it mm. like I, I spent quite a lot of time in 2022 going around and watching a lot of the women's domestic stuff in, in the north and they doing double headers for example one of the games I went to at Headingley had a women's game before a men's t20 blast game but it was done in the week when people were still at work or people were still at school so everyone kind of piled in for the men's game when it when work and school had finished but the mm. women's game wasn't played in front of very many people and then a couple of weeks later i went to one at old trafford where the women's game was actually played after the men's game but by that point it was so late mm. that all the kids in the crowd were kind of going home and mm. everyone kind of wanted to go home and had enough um and that kind of seems like a missed opportunity. We've seen the success of double headers in the hundred. Um, so to make that a success would have been a better way to do it. And also just how county um, women's domestic cricket is covered in terms of media and live streaming. We've seen great improvements be made over county cricket streams in the last few years. But when you go on to watch a lot of the Rachel Hayhoe Flint streams or the Charlotte Edwards Cup streams, they're still pretty basic um, and they're still, it, it still kind of is pretty unclear in terms of what's going on. Mm. So making it more visible in that way where you've got these clips on social media that are actually watchable and you can identify mm. who's playing the shot, like the Grace Scriven shot that, that we talked about. Um, I think that would be a really good step forward. So it's not just about the logistics and the nuts and bolts of how this restructuring is going to work. It's about how it looks and how all the different add-ons go into to making this change a success rather than just saying, here you go, now make the most of it yourselves, mm. kind of thing. Um, Phil, what's your moment of the week? Oh, I'm glad you asked. So just before I went away, uh, I interviewed Jimmy Adams, um, the West Indian Jimmy Adams, as opposed to the, the Hampshire sure stalwart yeah. Jimmy Adams. And it was about his life in cricket and it was, you know, fascinating really. Um, covered the full gamut up mm. to his days now as director of cr- cricket until last year, but now involved as batting coach with the, the current iteration. He's seen a lot. He's played with, with some of the all-timers. And he told me a story about his debut test match that I have to tell you. This will appear in the next magazine um, coming out in a couple of weeks. But he told me about his debut test. Now, I don't know if what, you know too much about this test match, but 1992, South Africa and West Indies played each other for the first ever time. And it was the first test after readmission, after 22 years in sporting isolation due to apartheid. And South Africa and West Indies played each other. So symbolically very important game. Played at Barbados and it was Jimmy's debut. And South Africa had a good side. Uh, And after four days, Jimmy said he was distraught because they were staring down the barrel. And uh, 
South Africa needed 80 odd to win with eight wickets in hand going into day five. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to read out what actually happened. Uh, I didn't sleep. I was rooming with Courtney. He put me in the living room because he couldn't take it any longer. You spend your whole life dreaming about playing at that level. And then finally it comes. After four days, though, I was distraught. Can you imagine this? Historic test. West Indies v South Africa for the first time. And we're going to lose it. So they need 80 odd to win. Eight wickets in hand. Brian Lara comes up to him on the morning of the game. He said, Jimmy, we just need one. And he said, Brian, we need eight. He said, no, no, <laughs> we just need one. So the morning starts. Courtney uh, bowling to Kepler Vessels, the brilliant gnarly ke- skipper, and Peter Kirsten. Vessels and Kirsten are the not-out batsmen. Early on, uh, Courtney nicks off Kepler Vessels. Lara takes a brilliant one-handed catch. Lara comes in. Right, lads, it's, it's in. We're done. And Jimmy says, we still need another seven. He said, don't worry about it. We're done. Jimmy's fielding at bat pad, right, for the rest of the game. This is what has happened. So Brian Lara, quote, normally comes home from a day's play, goes to sleep, wakes up at midnight, and then hits the road. Mid-test match. So at midnight, 12 a.m., he's gone into this pub in Barbados and found the whole of the South Africa team, minus Kepler and Peter Kirsten, the not-out batsman. And they're celebrating the win. They don't need 80 odd, eight wickets in hand. They're already celebrating the win. So Brian, quote, plies them with rum until five o'clock in the morning. All of them are absolutely <laughs> legless. Hansi Kronje, all them, they're absolutely loaded. They couldn't function. Quote, I'm fielding at bat pad and could smell the alcohol. <laughs> Once we got Kepler, Courtney and Kirtley did the rest. They won by oh. 22 runs. But fair play to, to Brian for taking that catch to, to start. Indeed. It all off if he Indeed. was there until Indeed. five a.m. But what a routine. Yeah. Knocking off at the end of the day, probably 130, you know, out, having a kip, getting up, going out yeah. at midnight, getting in at five. And and apparently, he, he, teams you say, how does he do it? He said, no, he's having more sleep than you lot. He's going home, <laughs> going, going to bed for six hours, then going out at midnight. Oh, anyway, there you go. Um, Laura is someone I'd, I'd love to read more about in, in, in the months to come. If, if only uh, that were possible, eh? Um, Katya, what was your moment of the week? Uh, my moment of the week was one of the three amazing WPL games, which was the one that um, Delhi Capitals won by one run over mm. RCB. It's been a really good week for WPL, really close games. This one was the closest. Um, DC set massive score, 180 odd. Alice Capsi again, playing really well, 48 off, off 32 balls. Jemima Rodriguez got a, got a half century. Um, and in response, um, Delhi Capitals, RCB, sorry, or 142 for three with three overs left. So they needed 39-ish off 18 balls. Sophie Devine gets out. Georgia Waring comes in, hits a couple of boundaries, gets out. Risha Gosh playing beautifully, half century off like 28 balls in the end. Final over, 11 runs needed. Gosh whacks a six off the first ball. Um, off the first ball of Jess Jonathan, back over her head. She's then almost run out in a moment of controversy where the batsmen nearly, batters nearly don't cross, mm. um, but she stays on strike, hits another six, um, needs two runs off the last ball to win, hits it to point, puts in the dive, can't quite get there, um, and DC win it by by one run. Huge drama, amazing. Mm. Um, and you had an, uh, the one the night before that as well, um, you had a really close Mumbai Indians win um, that was off the penultimate ball, Harman Precor, um, hit the winning runs, 95, not out, strike rate of nearly 200. Um, wow. Yeah, brilliant. But and What what was crazy about that Harman Preet knock is that they needed 91 off the last 36. At that point, she had scored 20 <laughs> off 21. Bloody so hell. So she hit what? 75 off her last 27 balls. Uh, and then also there was a moment before the penultimate over of the game where the sprinklers just come on. Uh, <laughs> so... They're spraying up on, uh, I think it's Beth Mooney, the opposition captain, saying like, well, hang on, the springs are off, but we need to we need to dry the outfield now. <laughs> so they have to get the super soppers on. Everyone's like looking like, could this go to DLS? Are they actually, have they managed to get the nose in front or not? But then they come back on and Humphrey yeah. called, hasn't missed a beat. So yeah. Fantastic. You had another amazing game in, or pretty good game. This was actually probably the least close of the lot, but it was still a really good game last mm. night um, where Dipti Sharma hit 88 off 60 balls. Um, and couldn't quite get UP Warriors over the line, but it came down to the last over. She, If she'd come back for the second, there might have been the possibility yeah. of like hitting a boundary off the last ball and they winning needed it. needed 25 off the last over. There was a Y, they scrambled through, and she hit two sixes. Um, yeah. She's, she had an amazing time. Exactly. Also worth saying, in, in that game, um, Shabnam Shaquille, who is 16 mm. years old, um, playing her like third or fourth game of the tournament, comes on for the first over of the chase and dismisses Alyssa Healy and Chamari Atapatu in her first over. She's 16 years old. She's 16 years old. One to watch. Um, ben, 
you claimed before we start recording that the last few days of franchise cricket across the WPL and the W and the PSL have been up there with the best few days in the history of franchise T20 cricket. A, a long weekend to rival Phil's in Vienna, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so Cash run through quite a lot of the uh, the WPL, just a couple of additional details. In that game last night, the Deep T1 UP Warriors were 4 for 3, 35 for 5. Deep mm. T's weak, so she hadn't made more than 30 in the WPL four knocks ago and has since uh, upped her best score in the competition four times. So she's gone 33 53 not out, 55 and then 88 not out. That's what Zach Crawley did at the start of his career. Exactly, yeah. With there having been some questions over her suitability in T20 cricket, pretty much answered. And then if you go back four games, uh, the night before that, uh, the Mumbai, the, the Harman Preet Core win, um, it was another one run win where OP Warriors beat, uh, uh, they beat Delhi. So deeply hit 50 and then took four weeks to spend 138. And Delhi collapsed from 112 for three to 136 to lose that by by one run so that's been crazy it could yet be a three-way tie for the last playoff spot and then in the PSL you've also had four last ball finishes in succession so you've had eight games across four days in two competitions basically all of which have gone down to the last or the second last ball so last night Peshawar Zalmi defend 147 by two runs the night before you'll love this if you haven't seen it Keta Gladiators hit a six off the last ball uh, Mohamed Wasim I think it's the second ball he phase hit six and then Viv Richards is one of their coaches and charges onto the field with them having won it to to seal pl- the playoff spot. Everyone's getting a sort of a, a mass pile on. You also had in that game Shaheen promoting himself, smashing a 50 and then uh, taking his helmet off and sort of shushing his critics because uh, <laughs> he's been getting some criticism from Wazi Makram, among others, for promoting himself. I mean, they've won one from 10, so maybe, uh, yeah. maybe, maybe great, they have some sort of point. Night before, great. N- night before that, Islamabad United chased 229 off the last ball. Uh, Imad Wasim hit six and four of the last two balls. Usman Khan hit 100. He's now got three PSL 100s and is yet to play international cricket. No one knows if he wants to play for UAE or Pakistan, but he's great. My only question is, is Gawa still commentating on it? Not he this hasn't year. done it this year. No, no. Year, no. He's the voice of the PSL. It's one of the great incongruous <laughs> matchups. <Yeah. laughs> um, and then, so that's, that's two of the PSL games covered off. Night before that, Karachi Kings went from needing 60 off 31 to needing eight off the last over. Uh, and then Zaman Khan got it down to needing four off the last ball but then hits a, a bowls a full toss and it's a, and that's hit for four. So that's mm. eight sort of stone cold classics and, and not, not a dud in there. So yeah, it's been pretty good. <laughs> I'm going to ask you in a month's time uh, to, to recollect anything that happened in any of those games. <laughs> uh, and then there was an, there's an amazing hat trick from Sri Lanka's Nuan Dasara uh, in, in a Sri Lanka Bangladesh game. That's your moment of the week. Uh, it'll be quite interesting to see how he goes in the, in the um, IPL because he's a slightly older Sri Lankan guy with a really slingy action, obviously, who swings it miles. Oh, it's that lad. Yeah. yeah. I've seen him. Well, yeah. but there's there's a few of them. So there's also Patharana, who is also a very slingy Sri Lankan bowler. But Tashari, yeah, he had figures of, of four wickets for for one run after 10 balls or nine balls, I think, in this nice. game. Mm. And unsurprising, they won. Also, I just love how these two sides, that the rivalry is great. So they've had the timed out in the World Cup and they are making no effort to sort of like quieting down that controversy so very first Bangladesh wicket of the series the Bangladesh bowler is, is tapping his watch and then when Sri Lanka win the series they're all there with the trophy tapping their watches <laughs> so it's, uh, forgot to mention the PSL uh, the guy we mentioned last week Usman Tariq he's got that brilliant action <laughs> yeah. uh, he's been done for chucking so great story uh, hope to see him back in action soon uh, and finally the answer to the trivia question um, 2014-15 Eng- Eng- England's worst winter what do you reckon 2014-15 Good shout. This, is, this is by number of games lost. No, but I, like, no white ball spot. I think it'll be a 90s winter where they played some weird tri series that had eight games in it or something for 94 some five. reason. Cool, the, you're all wrong. Uh, <laughs> the answer is. 067. Uh, that's second. The answer is we're played 23 1 5 and lost 18 is 2013 14. Um, so oh, obviously, right. yeah, of course. obviously, everyone remembers what happened in the Ashes. So uh, they, oh, the they, they, they they lost those. Uh, but yes, at the end of that winter was the World T Twenty, yeah. and in between that was shit loads of white ball cricket in preparation for that that they didn't do very well in and either. Ending with losing to the Netherlands, did it? It ended with a forty-five run loss against the Dutch at Chattergram. Um, and I was looking looking at. You know some of the some of the winters that are up there. So oh six oh seven they lost seventeen. Uh, twenty three twenty four is right up there. Lost seventeen from twenty two. Um, ninety eight ninety nine is great. 
because there's a game where England travelled all the way to Bangladesh for a knockout one-day tournament. Uh, they lost the first game and, and flew back. Um, that was in, in uh, yeah, 98, 99, uh, where they also lost the Ashes and lost a, an enormous tri-series tournament that England played 13 games in. Um, as well, and also I, I, struggled in a Charger tournament. I forgot about the World Cup. That was this winter, wasn't it? Yeah, the England World Cup was this winter. That, 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 that was why people. God, were, we've were been shit. And and the two <laughs> and the two lost series in in the Caribbean as well. Yeah. So so it, is, it has been really crap. Magnificent. Um, and also, I guess they used to be. Remember that England used to call uh, England made a big fuss about how they didn't like having Ashes tours, then World Cups mm. back to back. So you can sort of pick any of those as as really bad winters. They're <laughs> they're all up there. Um, anyway, well done if you if you got that right at home. Uh, that is it for today. Uh, Eighty seven minutes at the moment. Uh, yeah, cheers, Phil, cheers, Katia, cheers, Ben. Up we'll be Oscar. back yeah. next week. <laughs>